So this session is on uh, test driving React JS code. Uh, again, it's a fancy title. I didn't know how many people in the audience would expect what. So it's kind of pretty open. We'll figure out what's the best to do as we go along. Uh, it's only a 45 minute session. Uh, this is typically a 90 minute session where we actually do live programming. Uh, but this, this time, I don't think we'll have enough time to do live programming. So I'll mostly kind of walk you through some of the things that I've done. Uh, but just kind of to get a feel of who's in the room, let's start with some basic stuff here. Uh, how many people do object-oriented programming here? Most people. All right. What about the rest of you who didn't put up your hands? Too busy on your phones. Uh, so the folks who do object-oriented programming, uh, probably a lot of, uh, at least my initial career with object orientation was about trying to model the real world, right? To me, object orientation was about how can I model the real world uh, in, in this thing? And so, you know, you would have stuff like this uh, drawn all over with UMLs and stuff like that. Uh, and soon we kind of started getting into things like this, where we had different kinds of stuff. So you started having these hierarchy of objects. And you, know, you start deriving one object from another object, mostly to reuse code, uh, and you know, less so much in terms of uh, this is structurally how things should be structured and stuff like that. And the next thing you know is your project has kind of grown into some mess like this. Does this sound familiar? Yeah? All right. Then I'm in the right room. Or you're in the right room. Uh, a few years ago, I used to work for a medical company. And we were building some software to automate a whole bunch of stuff that happens at a hospital. And uh, I remember having this classic debate uh, where you know, a bunch of programmers were arguing. Uh, basically, we had to figure out uh, we had patients, we had doctors. Uh, patients, uh, basically, the doctors give shots to the patients. Uh, and so the classic debate was, you know, you have a patient object and you have a, a doctor object or a you know, surgeon object. Uh, would the doctor object have a give shot method or would the patient have a take shot method? Where would you put this method? And you wouldn't believe we spent about two hours arguing about it. Uh, and in the end, we couldn't conclude what's the right approach. So, sorry? How? The, the final implementation was we had a clinic object which basically had a, a record a shot method. <laughs> because it doesn't matter who gave a shot to whom, whether the patient took the shot themselves or a doctor gave the shot, doesn't matter. All we are interested in is we should be charging the patient for it. <laughs> right? Uh, so you have all these uh, classic debates, and which is why I think OO in general gets a pretty bad name. And these days, it's not cool to do object orientation, right? Like uh, all the cool kids seems to be talking a lot about functional programming these days. Uh, so what I want to actually try and sneak in here in this particular uh, demo here is uh, kind of try and strike a balance between object orientation and functional programming uh, and kind of see how TDD can help with that journey. And if you take something like React, uh, I think it's a, it's a pretty nice balance of basically you know, object orientation to a little bit uh, and then uh, a lot of functional thinking behind the scenes, uh, which is kind of what we will build on top of uh, in this particular session. Uh, and we're going to try and see how uh, TDD can actually help uh, with something like this. And again, with, with TDD, uh, as we get into the session, you will see uh, for a lot of people, TDD is about testing. And to me, that's the last thing about TDD. Uh, it's actually a side effect, not, uh, not the objective. So anyway, uh, what we're going to try and achieve is I'm going to walk you through some basic setup, uh, walk you through some code that uh, we have, uh, which is for basically building a simple uh, commenting system. And then we're going to talk about some of the next steps. So uh, Confingen is a platform that I've built. Some of you might have used. Uh, in Confingen, we have this feature where people can comment on proposals and stuff like that. Uh, and this whole section essentially is what you know, I want to demonstrate how we can build this in a, uh, you know, in a React style 
programming. Is everyone here familiar with test-driven development? Yep. Cool. Let's do a quick recap just for the benefit of others, and then we will jump through. Thanks. So with test-driven development, the idea is we start with an automated test. Yes? We run the test. What do we expect to see? What happens if it passes? <laughs> Sorry, what was that? What happens? We are screwed up. Absolutely. Uh, most often, it basically means that the test you wrote was wrong. Uh, very few people actually do that step, uh, and it's surprising because they would have written a whole bunch of code to realize the test was anyway passing uh, before they started. Uh, so the idea is that the test should fail, uh, and you make a little change to the code. Uh, what do we mean by little? Few seconds, few minutes worth of change, not few days or years worth of work. Uh, and then you run the test. If it fails, you continue to make a change. The goal is to get the test to pass. Yeah? And then once the test passes, what do we do? We look at, uh, you know, basically, we started with the test. We did a little bit of design as we coded along, but we didn't really do a deep thinking around the design. And at this point, we want to pause stand back, reflect on what we just wrote. Is there a better way to uh, design this? Do we see uh, improvements in terms of simplicity, flexibility of communication of the code? And so we basically you know, do some automated refactoring at this stage, uh, go back, run the test, because ideally you want to make sure that you, know, you refactor when you have passing tests. And once you're done with refactoring, your tests are still passing. Uh, and then you go back and repeat the cycle. Right? That's in a nutshell. Uh, what test-driven development is all about. I remember reading about this in 2001, uh, and I, I actually fell off a chair laughing because I thought someone was joking. Like, how could you possibly write a test before you write any code? Uh, and it just seemed like a completely alien concept. Uh, but I think it, after four years of playing around with stuff, it finally kind of uh, settled in, and I could get a sense of why test-driven development actually makes sense. Uh, and in the last two years, actually, I've not done any test-driven development. So it's kind of an interesting journey for me over the last uh, 12 years or so, maybe more. But anyway, uh, this session, we're going to look at uh, you know, this cycle of how we're going to actually do this on a React.js kind of a component. And you know, especially uh, when we talk about this, a lot of people these days say, this makes sense on the server side of things, and I know how to do it on the server side. But it, when it comes to UI code, uh, let it be web UI or mobile UI, uh, people have lots of challenges of how to actually do something like this. And I think there are a bunch of frameworks which actually make this relatively easier compared to others, and React is one of them, uh, in my opinion. So uh, all the code that I'm going to be showing is already up on GitHub. You can go get it from GitHub. You can basically clone this uh, GitHub repo. Uh, it, it is essentially a demo of React with Karma, Jasmine, Webpack, Babel, ES6. Uh, you know, essentially to get you all of that stuff. So the idea is to kind of uh, get this project, do an NPM update, uh, and then you can do NPM run test, and you should see about 32 tests in there passing. I'm going to quickly show a demo here, and then uh, you know, kind of jump into what we are doing here. So let me mirror my screen. Already ran the test, so just kind of doing it again real quick. Uh, so a whole bunch of tests ran. Let's uh, do it from here again real quick. You would actually see that it does uh, bring up real browsers and runs the tests in the browsers, uh, so you get the feedback. So notice it's uh, brought up all these browsers here, which are essentially listening to the events that we are firing here. And it's run all the tests that we have written so far, and it kind of goes through that. Uh, 
So I, what I plan to do is spend some time kind of talking through uh, how we've written the test, walk through, talk about some of the typical challenging scenarios and explain how you can actually cover those uh, using tests. So it won't be so much of a live demo because we only have 45 minutes, but I want to do cover like interesting things like how do you do uh, stub out Ajax calls, how do you do other kinds of things because those are the notorious parts uh, that get in the way of doing test driven development on something like this. Is that cool? Let's quickly go back to the slides uh, real quick. Uh, so quick commercial break, uh, my name is Naresh, I live in Mumbai, don't act in Bollywood. I used to work for a company called Directi. Uh, we just sold one of our business units for 900 million. Uh, I was a partner at a company called Industrial Logic with Joshua. Uh, we built e-learning uh, for learning some of these skills. Uh, changing programmers was really hard, so I decided to quit and I uh, started uh, building another startup called Adventure Labs where we built games for kids to learn mental arithmetics. Uh, that was far more fulfilling. Uh, I've been doing a whole bunch of conferences in India. Uh, I started the Agile movement back in 2004. We uh, ran, uh, we continue to run the Agile India conference. We also run a whole bunch of other conferences in India. Uh, Confingen, which is a platform that you might have used, uh, was is basically a pet project I keep building. Uh, I work at a company called Hike Messenger. Uh, we basically uh, is a messaging app uh, customized totally for Indian audience, uh, mostly teenagers. Uh, we happen to be the fastest unicorn in India, uh, 3.7 years to the billion dollar status. So a lot of uh, interesting learning, a lot of uh, different kinds of startup environments I've worked in, which makes me believe that a lot of stuff in Agile is just bullshit. Don't hold back now. Sorry? Don't hold back. Don't hold back. Uh, it'll keep coming through all, all along. <laughs> So uh, let's quickly jump and talk about the, uh, the basically the component that we want to build. Uh, this component, I'm going to quickly describe what are the features and then we're going to start talking about how we're going to uh, test drive this component. Uh, so our component should have ability to accept uh, JSON comments from the server and basically display those comments, right? That's pretty standard. Uh, it should display the most popular, which is the one with the maximum likes on the top, yeah? If uh, what happens if two comments have the same number of likes? You have to handle that scenario. So if two comments have the same number of likes, then the most recent comment should show on the top, right? So you also have to take the time into account. Uh, there's also a feature of private comments, which are essentially comments. Uh, you can think of private or draft comments, which are only visible to the author who's putting the comment. It's not visible to other people. In Confingen, it's, uh, it's a feature where essentially it's visible to the program committee, but nobody else. So if, if, let's say, the speaker wants to leave a private message or someone else wants to leave a private message saying, this speaker is bullshit, don't accept this speaker, so then they, they leave a private comment, they don't leave a public comment. Uh, uh, people should be able to like comments, uh, stuff like that. Uh, the one other thing is there's an Ajax call that refreshes the comments every few uh, seconds, few minutes kind of stuff. So this is kind of uh, what we want to build as a feature set. Uh, so what I want you to do is I want you to take like five minutes, quickly think about how would you take this kind of a problem and break it down to incrementally build it out, right? To me, the first step of TDD, which is I think very few people actually talk about it, is how do you basically take a problem down, get to the essence of it, and then incrementally build out the problem. Like that's the first step, honestly, in kind of test driving anything, and probably the most important step. So what I want you to do is take like five minutes and think about, given this problem, how would you actually break it down? And then we will walk through my solution and we will compare notes. Yeah? So it's not all sitting here eating popcorns and watching movies. It's a little bit of work as well.
everyone can read what's on the screen, right? Do you want me to increase the brightness? I can actually do that real quick. So the first one is basically should accept JSON uh, comments, uh, comments as a JSON format from an AJAX call from the server. So call the server, get the, get the JSON uh, comments. Um, the most popular ones basically how you're going to sort the array and then what's visible, what's not visible. And then the liking functionality, people should be able to like stuff. Okay, anyone wants to go first? What would be the first tests that we would write? JSON. Accepting the JSON. Uh, so would you call the server and get the JSON back? I mean, yeah, anyway. Or would you basically assume that you've got the server returning the JSON back and then you feed in the JSON and see what happens. Okay. Anyone else, like any other approach that you can think of? So he said he would essentially mock out the server, get the JSON and basically feed in the JSON and see if the uh, comments show up. Can you think of uh, Simpler, smaller step to get started with? Uh, so instead of trying to stub out the server and all of that, you would just feed in a stubbed out version of the JSON and see if it'll uh, show up. Okay, that's a slight improvement. Can we simplify it further? Because this seal steams like a pretty big jump to me. Sorry? Okay, it's possible that pages might not have any comments. So if you had nothing that came back from the server, if you had an empty JSON, uh, then what happens? Is there some kind of a behavior that's expected on the page? Right, that's, that's a decent starting point. Yeah? So you look for basically an empty condition uh, in some cases when you're doing something like this and you see if the empty condition essentially helps you move forward in the right direction, right? Uh, but simplifies, reduces the number of things you have to deal with. So it allows you to take a smaller baby step uh, to get kind of started with. Making sense? So shall we look at how that test would look? I'm going to uh, later kind of walk you through and explain some of the stuff that's happening here. Uh, but let's kind of start here first. So this says should give a nice message when uh, there are no comments. So let's look at what that looks like. So basically saying uh, mount this uh, comments component that we have and pass in an empty array right, because there are no comments in this. And then you would expect comments.find a uh, div empty to be present and a div empty to have text be the first one to comment. I'll, does this make sense? We'll talk about what those some strange looking things over there are, but that's kind of our first test that we would write. 
So now let's kind of step back and talk about what's going on here. So, I mean, JSON, uh, this basically comments component is our uh, React component that we have built, uh, which accepts comments. We passed it empty, and we're using a library called uh, Enzyme. Uh, what Enzyme does is it basically allows you to you can pass in a J, uh, you can pass in a React component to it. It basically renders it without actually, uh, you know, without, it kind of renders it, simulates it, and gives you handle to what was rendered. And then it gives you access on top of it where you can do more like if you're used to the jQuery style querying, you can do kind of jQuery style querying of the DOM uh, in memory DOM by allowing you to do basically things like comments.find, and you can give uh, things that you want to find, uh, selectors basically, and then say, what do you expect to happen? Okay, so I've used here in this particular thing, I've used uh, Enzyme, and then I have used something called, uh, let's load this up. Uh, there's a plugin for uh, Jasmine called uh, Enzyme, uh, Jasmine Enzyme, which allows you to basically write these uh, to, pre to present, to have kind of expectations on top of this. So this would be our first test that we would write. And then basically, uh, let's jump to our component here real quick. So essentially, if we, if we wrote this from scratch, all you would do is you would check if it's empty. Then you would return an empty component with the message saying to be uh, be the first person to comment or something like that. Yeah. So once this is done, what's the next test that you're going to write? So we've got the empty condition handled, right? I want to talk through some scenarios and then I'm going to jump in and talk about some of the plumbing that we have done and stuff like that that might be helpful for people who want to do go back and do this uh, on your project. Uh, so once we've got basically the basic condition handled, the next thing that we want to look at is so we handled zero. Now we want to do one, right? You pass in one comment and then you want to handle that. Even with the one comment, you don't want to take into account the sorting and the uh, other kind of logic yet, right? You don't want to worry about the likes and other kinds of things. You just want to say, if I give a comment, does the comment actually get rendered correctly? Which basically means the comment has some kind of a header. If we go back here uh, to our example, where was the page? Notice there's some header over here uh, and then the actual comment below there. Uh, so we want to basically figure out if it's actually rendering it in this particular format, right? So the next thing that we will do is we're going to take uh, a single comment, all right? And we're going to mount a single comment. A single comment is essentially just defined here, which has an ID, a message, the user who did this. And when we originally start, we won't have this updated on or likes or whatever. We will incrementally add those later. Uh, but when we start, we will only start with basically the ID message and the user. Uh, that's the JSON that we get back. So if we got that JSON back, we're going to do again same thing, uh, comments component and pass the comment in there uh, and see what all are the things we will see. We want to see that uh, comment is present, the length is one. And it has a header, which basically has, uh, you know, when you just spread out the text, it should have narration one like. And then the, actually when we start, we won't even have the likes. Uh, this is over a period of time when we've evolved. And then it should have the first comment, which is what is the comment being passed here. Make sense? And then what is the code that we will write to make this, uh, essentially, this test pass? We would have passed in the comments, which would essentially call comments.map and then create the component, comment component. At this stage, we will start seeing, okay, there will be many comments. 
So instead of uh, trying to create each of these, we we'll actually spin off a comment component, which itself knows how to render a comment, right? With a header, uh, which has the user, and then forget about the form right now. Then it would have the body, which basically has the message, right? So this will help us basically flush this portion out and uh, call the map method on it to simply spit it out. And that should get us the second test working, right? I know it can be a little boring to just see code on the screen, uh, not much interactive. Uh, what I'm going to try and do is kind of engage you a little bit more, but I want to just explain some of the basic foundational stuff before we start getting into a little bit more details around what's going on here. How many people here program in React, just so I know if it makes sense to you or not? One or two, OK. Then this might not make a lot of sense to you, but I'll try my best to see if. Uh, so actually, let me kind of quickly step back and explain a little bit about React, so maybe you will, it'll help you understand uh, some basic concepts. So you, you can create a React component by simply extending the React component class. You give in a constructor. Uh, this is, again, ES6, so you're essentially writing more like object-oriented style code. Uh, so it has a constructor, and then there is a render method, which basically gets uh, called. Uh, and the render method should basically spit out the HTML that you want to print. Right? That's the very simplistic way of looking at uh, React. The, the, we'll talk a little bit about the uh, when does the render method called and stuff like that, uh, which is what I think is the nice part about React, is that it decouples uh, yourself from having to maintain, uh, you know, directly updating the DOM and stuff like that. It essentially takes care of that. Uh, what React has is a concept of state. So whenever the state gets updated, it essentially uh, re-renders the component. Uh, and how it re-renders, when it re-renders, basically it decouples the programmer from having to worry about those things. Uh, essentially, what it, do, what it does, which is very important on large, complicated websites, is it essentially does a diff of the DOM and only uh, takes the changes that have been applied and only refreshes those elements onto the actual browser. So it maintains something called as a virtual DOM uh, in which it keeps maintaining the state of what's changed and basically applies the delta onto the actual browser DOM. Uh, so this way, you know, it basically reduces the uh, the jarring effect that you get on a lot of sites and you know programmers have to really work carefully to change those things it essentially decouples you from all of worrying about all of those and at this point essentially what they're trying to do is they're trying to apply a bunch of functional transformations uh, by looking at you change this what is the delta of sequence of uh, changes that happen and then basically work off a virtual drum and apply those delta changes on the browser. So that's more of a functional style of thinking where you're essentially transforming the DOM uh, from one state to another state in you know uh, idempotent kind of a scenario without you know having to worry about kind of state changes and state management yourself. So that's a little bit of a background about React. Uh, I don't know if I've done justice to explaining React in two minutes, but uh, any doubts, like let me pause and ask if uh, people have any doubts or concerns so far. Uh, like do you get the basic idea behind React? Essentially you have some state, you update the state, React itself handles uh, the updating of the DOM for you, so you only have to worry about how you want this component to get rendered. The other thing is that the way information gets passed to these React components, there are two ways you can do that. One is through, you will see this this.props. whatever. So this.props is one way of basically passing in values into the components. Uh, so in our case, if you see, we are essentially from here, uh, when you say React component and you say com comments over here, inside this essentially you would be saying props. Oops. So here we've got the comments. When you mount, you basically pull out the props, uh, props comments, and then you use that to render the component for you. 
So the two ways, one is the state, this dot state, the other is this dot props. So in this case, the logged in user case, we're basically using the props. Uh, state is anything that actually reflects on the UI that changes the way the UI looks. So you basically store that in state. Things that don't actually affect the UI, you essentially keep it in props. And so you decouple the two that way and essentially manage the state of your components without having to worry about how to render the DOM, when to render the DOM. You simply spit out what HTML you want this to spit out and then your job is done. So like this is a classic case of a React component where uh, this has no state. The ideal way is actually not having any state, using everything through the props and essentially, uh, you know, like in this case, there is a callback handle which when you click on like, it will call back the props, uh, call back the parent component. So that's my two minute explanation of React, which is terrible, but I'm not gonna try and do justice to explaining React in five minutes. Uh, I would try and assume that keep React as a black box if it's not making too much sense, don't worry about that. Let's kind of talk through how you will progress through the tests and basically uh, at least understand how we would approach this from a test driven point of view, right? Would you prefer me switching to some other language or tool? Would that help you understand better? Since only two people understand React, it's a bit of a challenge to explain the whole React thing. I think the testing aspect will be the same. Yeah, the, 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 like what I wanted to actually do in this session was go more deep dive, the deep dive into some of the challenges around how you stub out things and how you do things. Uh, which obviously depends on how you're writing your React components and stuff like that. So a little bit of knowledge of React actually would help you appreciate some of this. If you don't quite understand React, maybe it's going to be a challenge, but I'm happy to go with it. It's easier for me. All right. Uh, so we've got the one comment thing passing. Uh, what would you do next? So we started with zero comments, so you, let's assume you didn't get any comments. Uh, notice so far we're not even calling the server. We are not interested in calling the server. We are just saying, assuming you've got the JSON, how do you render it, right? That's the step number one. Step number two is assuming that you got one comment, you want to basically make sure the header and the actual comment body is displayed correctly, right? Which is what we are verifying over here, uh, that the header and the comment body is shown correctly, right? What would be the next logical step for us? There are two paths we can go down. One is we can say that the ones with the maximum likes should show up on the top, right? The other path is we can say in the two comments, the most recent comment should show up on the top, right? The two kind of functionality that would next we would build. So let's look at the, you know, it should display the most recent comment on the top. And in this case, essentially, uh, we're going to pass in two, uh, three JSONs in this case, uh, three comments JSON, each one having an update time. And then what we'll essentially verify here is once you mount the component, you get back the DOM, then you're going to find out that if you passed in three elements, then the length of the comments div should be three, essentially all three comments should be displayed. Uh, the header of the first comment should be uh, Jack in this case, because Jack is the one who commented the last, which is 20, 40, 12, 19, which is when I wrote this code. So it's been about two years now. Uh, and uh, basically the last comment should be the most, uh, the, the oldest comment which happens to be 2014-06-19, right? So this helps us understand that our code is essentially sorting based on the dates and displaying the most recent comment on the top, right? Yep. Uh, we went from one to three and essentially the, the reason for jumping to, we could have done with two as well, uh, but the reason to jump to three was essentially to see that it displays all three in the sorted order. So first and third is what we are kind of comparing. Uh, we could 
we could also do it with two. Uh, I, I, I mean, I think I'm not too hung up either ways. It's fine if we did with two. Uh, but three gives me a little bit, slightly little bit more confidence that all three are actually sorted correctly. Right? And all we are asserting here is what's the first and the last and assuming the middle one is already uh, there. So that way we kind of get all three validated. So how would you implement this in the code? There is, uh, so if you actually see the structure of the code, we have, we've kind of split it into, uh, you know, model and view. And we have a comments model, which essentially takes all the comments that we've got, uh, constructs these little comment objects out of it, and then has a sort method on it, which essentially sorts based on a compare method. Right, and the actual compare method uh, is in the uh, actual the the smaller comment object that we have, which is essentially if likes are equal, then look at the last updated, else return based on the likes. One could technically argue these specs that we are writing here. Where is the spec? Uh, the spec that we are writing here. Are these unit tests? What do you think? I wouldn't call them as unit tests. Uh, I have a new term for them to confuse people. I call them component tests. Uh, sorry? That's what you would call them. It's, it's more like a spec for this component, how this component behaves. Uh, some people even might go to the extent of calling this an acceptance test for the component. Uh, but this is not really a granular unit test. What would be a unit test in this case? A unit test would essentially be like you would take your model guy and you would test the sort method, for example. Right? A, a, a test on the sort would be a unit test. Right. In this case, I have uh, not really written test unit tests for uh, these individual components because I think they are still at a stage where they are relatively simple. Uh, but once you start building a lot of logic into them, it would actually make sense to start unit testing them at the at this level, at the model level directly, instead of trying to test it through the view. Right. Right now, we are actually testing it via the view. So I would call the spec that we have written as a component spec, uh, not necessarily as a unit test. And this is generally what people refer to as an outside-in way of doing test-driven development. Uh, so we, re we are kind of doing uh, an outside-in how a consumer would see uh, this perspective, right? business or user-facing kind of test. So I call these as component tests, or some people might call it acceptance test. I would actually have something a little bit more higher uh, for an acceptance test. Uh, this is still, like to me, a component test. And the advantage I find with something like React is I can actually have these uh, component tests, and that should be good enough. Once my component starts getting too complicated, uh, the way I would have structured my code in, in terms of the models and the views, I could then go into the model and start unit testing the models, and so containing that logic over there and basically testing it out. So it still gives you a fairly good separation, and it gives you a nice way of basically testing uh, at lower layers when you need to. If you don't, then you just test it at the view layer, and that's good enough. Yeah? Make sense? Again, uh, test-driven development would, in my opinion, by itself not force you to do this. So for example, I could have not separated the component, uh, the models out, and I could have had all of that code in. But it's more of just good design thinking, design principles applying those, uh, and basically pulling out things into smaller pieces. Uh, and if you kind of keep that in mind, you would end up with code which is fairly decoupled in my opinion and things that can be nicely managed, smaller chunks. Uh, and that's kind of typically what we try and push for is having code which is smaller chunks and pushed out 
so they are individually manageable units, right? So we have like comment and comments, uh, and in the view we have again similarly comments, which essentially manages the rendering of the whole thing, and then rendering of each comment itself is separated out as a thing, right? So one is a collection, another one is an individual element. Five minutes, all right. Let's uh, look at something a little bit more interesting. So we can go on and we can look at private comments and all of those use cases, but let's look at fetching uh, data from a URL and displaying it, how you would actually do that, uh, because that's typically kind of uh, interesting. So the one case is where you try to fetch something from the, uh, from the server and essentially the server didn't return back on time or the server basically gave an error condition. So in uh, Jasmine, there is uh, the spy on method. So essentially, we are stubbing out the Ajax call uh, and returning a, a fake call, which essentially is a, a, a kind of a deferred or a promise, which says if it's undefined, then basically return an error, uh, error getting this, else basically resolve it to a 400 status. Uh, and in this case, because we are uh, returning, uh, we are basically rejecting this, what you will end up getting from here is essentially comments should be zero, so there shouldn't be any comments, and there would be an error uh, being shown saying fail to fetch comments from the URL. So the little trick here is essentially what we are doing is we are spying the AJAX method on jQuery. So under the hood, we are essentially using jQuery for making AJAX call. So we are essentially uh, stubbing that out, if you will. Uh, or we are faking out the Ajax call, and we are simply returning a promise that would get resolved uh, to, in this case, it would basically error out uh, saying, please you know, give a URL. In the passing case, just let's look at that one to make a little bit of more sense. So here we are saying expected response is whatever earlier we were passing the JSON. So here we are saying this is the expected re response from the Ajax call. And then we are saying Jasmine Ajax stub request call to get and return basically this 200 status with the actual string, stringified JSON that we want. Uh, so this is another way to essentially stub out requests uh, on uh, you know, Ajax requests from Jasmine, so you would say jasmine.ajax.stub call, and whatever URL that you're using, so in this case it's localhost slash react component slash commence.php or whatever, so you're basically stubbing out that call and returning whatever you want to return as a response. So when you run this test, uh, J Jasmine essentially intercepts the call, the Ajax call, and returns uh, whatever you have given here in the sub call response directly. So this way, when I now do uh, mount this component, uh, we do need to do a set timeout in this case because this is an asynchronous call. Uh, so we do need to do a set timeout and essentially call this. So this is not my favorite way of doing it. I just put both these cases to just demonstrate there are two ways of doing it. I kind of prefer this more spy and uh, you know, promise-based approach because here I don't need to put any sleep or anything. Uh, and this is like a more preferred way of doing uh, you know, asynchronous requests. So I don't know if I've done justice to <laughs> this topic, uh, but I've uh, kind of tried to explain like the stubbing out the requests, how we would break this thing down into smaller tests. Uh, the other thing I quickly want to show you is some of the configuration, or maybe since most of you are not from uh, the React world, this might not make too much sense, uh, but there is a bunch of uh, plumbing that you need to do in Karma. Uh, so I'm right now running on all these browsers if you see the test. Uh, essentially using Webpack uh, to take this code and convert ES6 code, transpile it back to ES5, so it runs on actually on the browser. Uh, so you have to do a bunch of that stuff here. Uh, and there's some dependencies on React that you need to call out. Uh, two, 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 two. That's, yeah, and it essentially picks up the preprocessor, which is basically Webpack and SourceMy. And whenever you actually run these tests, I've also hooked up coverage with it. 
So you would actually be able to see uh, the code coverage of uh, what we are doing here. So that is also hooked up as part of this and every time you run the test it essentially uh, gets the code coverage spit out as well. Uh, I am not a big fan of code coverage, uh, I, I only look at it as a, as a way for me to see if I am kind of missing something but it is a lot of places I see code coverage gets used as a tool to measure how good someone's writing code which is kind of absurd uh, but yeah. And you can see that uh, there's some portions of the code that are actually not uh, not fully tested as part of this. For example, the update comment stuff, we've not written a test yet for it. So there is some more stuff to be done. So now this gives me feedback that ah, I kind of missed this, so let me go write the test for it. All right, uh, I think I'm out of time, but uh, that was a quick walkthrough uh, of test driving some React even though you didn't really see me test drive, it was already test driven. Uh, but I did show you the difference between a spec and a unit test and how, why you would separate those out, uh, the reason for having models and views and technically how you could run React, uh, how you could test drive React code using this. All right, uh, sorry, couldn't do much more than this, but uh, happy to take any other questions you have. I know I'm out of time now, so I'll gonna step up, step down, let the next speaker set up, and then be available for questions. Yep. All right, thank you.